Hey everyone, remember uh, what we did last time. We finished off the last video by showing that a diagonal uh, operator on a separable Hilbert space um, with respect to an orthonormal basis is compact if and only if the diagonal uh, approaches zero as we get further and further along the diagonal. And in particular, the strategy we employed for proving that uh, the di this diagonal operator is compact if the diagonal approaches zero um, as we go further along the diagonal was to approximate in the uh, operator norm uh, my diagonal operator by finite rank operators, which we know are compact. So the next results I want to um, uh, prove basically says that you can always do that for any compact uh, operator on a separable Hilbert space. Okay. So uh, let's say um, this is a separable Hilbert space. So T is compact if and only if um, in the operator norm, we can approximate T by finite rank operators. Okay, so to prove this, I need a uh, lemma, which says the following. Let's say uh, H again is a separable Hilbert space, or rather, um, Right, so if A is a bounded operator on a Hilbert space, then A is the limit of finite rank operators, um, still use, I guess, TN. Let's do, so. Let's do AN. Just And yeah, this is a strong operator topology limit. Okay. Uh, what's the proof? Well, the proof is not very subtle. We, we kind of do what we did um, in the at the end of the last video, and that's the kind of same strategy for proving this theorem. Uh, you kind of just break A up uh, into finite rank pieces uh, in the, the following uh, obvious way. Let's just say, um, let's say En is an orthonormal basis and let Pnx be just the orthogonal projection onto the span of the N uh, orthonormal basis elements E1 through En. So in other words, Pnx was just going to be X, Ek, inner product, times ek, sum this up, k equals one to n. So here ek again is an orthonormal basis for h. <clears throat> All right, so um, so we don't even really need that A is bounded. We just really need that A, uh, AX is in um, my uh, Hilbert space, really. Okay. So this means by Parseval's theorem,
Obviously, at this is finite. Right? Okay, well, AX is, of course, as long as it's in my Hilbert space, it's AX E K minus E K. Okay. Now let's say uh, a n is just p n applied to a. So defining um, a n following way. Well, p n just takes this sum here and just cuts off k equals one to n. So it cuts this sum off to to n. All right, so yeah, not much to this. Um, a, um, uh, a x minus a n x. So remember what uh, it means to have convergence in the strong operator topology. By our definition, uh, we need to show that for a fixed x, this converges to zero. Well, not a whole lot here. Um, just uh, this is going to be, well, we're subtracting off the infinite sum from here. So it's just tail k equals n plus one to infinity ax e k e k. And in the book, this is kind of part of the proof of the theorem, but I think it's worthwhile to state it as a, uh, its own little lemma. But, uh, right, and this is just, again, by Parseval's theorem, or Pythagorean's theorem, whatever. Um, AX um, squared. Uh, because this sum is finite, the tail here goes to zero as n goes to infinity. So AN converges to A SOT, strong operator topology. Okay, so the proof of the theorem now is as follows. Um, let Tn, just like before in this little lemma here, let's say Tn is Pn uh, composed with T. Using the book's notation, let's say Bc is the closed unit ball and H. This is just a Hilbert space norm. Right. So it's just a closed unit ball um, right. Uh, Uh, so actually, let's say this is equal to, uh, one. Uh, actually, no, I'll leave it as, uh, yeah, closed unit ball. So less than or equal to one. Okay. Um, so for epsilon bigger than zero, we have that the closure of the image of the closed unit ball under T is going to be the following uh, union, really not much to prove here, um, H N C. So here, this is the ball of center T H radius epsilon. Um, Right, so we're fattening up, uh, basically, we're fattening basically up the set T of BC. 
So actually, it's a subset. So I'll get that. This could definitely be larger, um, but uh, right. So uh, really, yeah, not much to this because um, we're looking at th for all h in this ball here, and we're fat. You know, we're taking the epsilon radius of that. So this is pretty trivial. Um, so compactness says. T is compact, so uh, this here is compact in H. Well, we can pick a finite subcover. So there exists Hj, let's say J equals one to little m, with norm uh, less than or equal to one, where um, yeah, where this is true. So the proof strategy is actually kind of interesting. Uh, by compactness, we're going to basically reduce matters to the, the previous lemma. Okay. And what allows us to do that is that we can get this finite subcover of uh, the closure of the image. So J equals one to M. T H J uh, epsilon. Uh, I keep writing equals less than or equal a uh, uh, subset of. Okay, so uh, let's finish up the proof. Okay. Right. So uh, right, we we know we proved that Tn converges in the strong operator topology to T. Okay. So from the lemma, we can pick big N where N bigger than big N implies that uh, Pn T I guess I'll write uh, Tn a little easier. Tn uh, Hj minus Thj is less than epsilon over three for all j equals one to m. There's a finite number of j's here, so absolutely no problem whatsoever doing this. And uh, yeah, of course, um, mention that, well, of course, this is finite rank. Don't know if I mentioned that in this uh, proof here, but um, this is obviously finite rank. I mean, well, it's obvious. I mean, um, you know, the the uh, image here, or the range rather of this operator. Um, is a subspace of just the span of the EKs as K equals one to N and that's finite dimensional, it's N dimensional. So certainly this is finite rank, it's AN and TN. All right, so um, yeah, now we're basically done. So if H uh, in norm is equal to one, then obviously H is in BC. So TH is in T of BC, obviously is um, subset of the closure, which is a subset of this finite cover. So we can fix some um, uh, J zero. Where this is true, uh, TH minus THJ zero is less than, well, Th is in one of these balls, so it's less than epsilon.
Okay. So Tn H, so remember our goal here, we want a uniform estimate over all H with norm one. We want an estimate that does not, we, we want to show that uh, we can make this small independent of H. Well, there is no H here. I pick a big N where a little n bigger than big N implies this. Then I pick an H. So this big N is most certainly independent of H. There's no issue whatsoever there. Right, so let's check that this is going to be less than epsilon and that'll take care of the proof. Okay, so we just add and subtract uh, some stuff here, use a triangle on equality. So it's Tn um, H minus Tn uh, H J T N H J minus uh, T H J plus T H J minus T H. Okay. Um, Right, so um, yeah, so let's call this whole thing here star. So one thing to note, it's kind of trivial, but uh, just in case you don't notice it, um, this is going to be for any uh, this is going to be just um, as we computed before um, T X E K. Obviously, this is less than or equal to the infinite sum, which is going to be just the norm of Tx. And obviously it's less than the norm of T of X. Yeah, it's something obvious, but in case, you know, in case it's not obvious, wrote it down. All right, so in particular, um, this here, is less than or equal to the norm of T um, actually I don't quite want that. So this is true, but let's leave I want to leave it as TX. Okay. So this is less than or equal to the norm of particularly TH minus T H J. And uh, sorry, it should be J zero, not J. It's J zero, I wanna use this right here. Uh, well, this is J zero. So we have two of these T H J zeros minus T H in norm, and they're both less than, uh, well, really one epsilon over three. So it's two epsilon over three plus this one here, Tn uh, Hj zero minus T um, Hj zero. But this one is less than epsilon over three just because uh, of this fact here. J zero is something between one and M. So this is true. So this one here is less than or equal to epsilon over three. So this is, uh, 
less than or whatever, it doesn't matter. So it's less than epsilon, okay. So big N is independent of H. So this is Well, this is equal to uh, the supremum here. And we got that this is less than epsilon. That takes care of the proof. Tn converges to T in the operator uh, norm. And again, the punchline here is that Thanks to this compactness, we we can reduce matters to basically just using that the strong operator topology convergence lemma, um, which we're allowed to do because we only have a finite number of the HJs to look at, thanks to compactness. Okay, and then we just use this uh, and the compactness to basically get what we want, thanks to this kind of obvious fact here. Um, right. So that this here is less than equal to TH minus THJ zero. All right, so, um, right. So let's prove a useful corollary, which is the following. Again, here H is a separable Hilbert space. So T is compact. So you can prove this for, um, uh, you can prove this for Bonnock spaces. It's a little more complicated. Uh, it's a little deeper than the kind of the level we're at right now, uh, but anyway. Um, T is compact if and only if the adjoint is compact. Okay, so I claim it's enough enough to show that T compact implies T star compact. Well, that's kind of obvious because that means T star compact implies T star star is compact. So that means T star compact implies T compact if we can prove uh, this. Okay. So that's our task to prove. Right. Okay. Um, so really, I would say this is more of a corollary of the proof of the last result. So uh, T compact, we proved that implies that Pn T minus T approaches zero as N goes to infinity. Remember, this is what I called uh, Tn. But I want this explicit form because what does this tell me? Let's take adjoints. This is T star uh, Pn. Pn, remember, is, I mentioned, it's the orthogonal projection onto the span of the uh, orthonormal elements E1 up to En. So it's its own, uh, it's self-adjoint, or if you really want to, just compute the adjoint and check that it's just Pn. Whatever, you take the adjoint here of Pn, 
uh, it's it's self adjoint. Well, this also goes to zeros and goes to infinity. Um, this isn't the operator norm. <clears throat> okay. Um, but this is finite rank. That's fairly trivial. So in particular, T star is the norm or the uh, operator norm limit of compact operators, particularly finite rank operators. That implies a T star compact. And this is, yeah, pretty trivially finite rank because uh, T star PNX, well, this is just T, k equals 1 to n, x, e, k, e, k. So just uh, by uh, linearity, okay. yeah, so t is linear, so this is simply going to be, um, move the e, k over, Well, this is just the sum here. And so this, you know, the, the, the range of T star PN is finite dimensional. It's a subset of the span of T E K for K equals one to N. So, um, I mean, some of these E Ks could be in the kernel. So it could, the dimension could be less than or equal to N. These need not be linearly independent, but certainly uh, the dimension is less than or equal to N. So this is trivially finite rank. Okay. Um, so I want to just mention a really interesting example. And if this intrigues you, if this kind of uh, tickles your fancy, something like this, then let me know. So a nice homework problem uh, and if you want to try this, please, by all means, send it to me and I'll check it over. But if you're interested in uh, operator theory on holomorphic function spaces, this is an excellent example to, uh, an excellent homework problem to, to do. So let's say we have a continuous, really just bounded compact, a bounded function um, with compact support. So CC of D, D is a unit disk in C, and we're assuming F uh, has compact support in D. And remember what the Toplitz operator is. For G in L2 of the disk, usual, with respect to ordinary area. Uh, this is just your orthogonal projection of F times uh, G. F, well, F is bounded. Um, so this is trivially a bounded operator um, from L2 to A2. So using uh, Montel's theorem, so actually, Really, P and uh, well, um, yeah. So it's really no different P between one and infinity, or uh, P equals two, really. So the claim is that TF is compact. On uh, the Bergman space, um, AP, for one, less than P, less than infinity. Uh, I think this is true for P equals, well, we haven't, no, we haven't done boundedness of the, um, the, the, the we haven't touched P equals one for the orthogonal projection. Uh, 
I think we mentioned, I'll just stick to, to two. Um, yeah, let's just stick to two. I mentioned the orthogonal projection is bounded um, from uh, LP to um, AP, but uh, anyway, so we're really, this is kind of a, mostly an operator theory um, kind of lecture, so stick to P equals two. So this is compact on P equals two. This is an orthogonal projection, so no issue about being bounded. So a really deep question, which I've done research on, Professor Zhu has done research on, um, is, uh, for precisely which F is TF compact? And so, uh, yeah, this is uh, intrigues you. Just let me know. I'll discuss this further. All right, so I want to now talk about uh, Hilbert Schmidt uh, operators. Okay, so uh, what's a Hilbert Schmidt operator? Um, and I'll discuss why we are we you know we care about these operators. And Schmidt is a uh, German mathematician uh, around the same time uh, as uh, Hilbert, a little bit a little bit younger than Hilbert. Um, But, um, right, so definition, um, T is bounded on a um, separable Hilbert space is Hilbert Schmidt if following is true. If this sum here is less than infinity, for some orthonormal basis En. Okay, so uh, interestingly, if this is true, Then, in fact, um, the sum here for any other orthonormal basis is also finite. All right, so what is the proof of this? Um, I would actually give this as a homework uh, if it wasn't in the book, because um, it's a really nice uh, just elementary, clever but elementary use of, I think it's like literally five or six uses of Parseval's theorem. Just use it over and over and over and over again. Um, but it is in the book, so it's kind of silly to give it as a homework. Um, yeah, so what's the proof? Uh, well, let's use Parseval's theorem applied to uh, TFN. So this is going to be equal to, um, so we have two different orthonormal bases, EN and FN. So I want to apply this to, uh, let's use the orthonormal basis FJ here.
And let's do the same thing for T E N with respect to this orthonormal basis. Okay, so I need uh, yet more um, uses of Parseval's theorem. So uh, in particular, we also have that um, the following sum here, n equals one to infinity of T star Fj Fn, is obviously going to be the norm of T star Fj squared, but I can also write this in terms of um, the ENs. Let's T star Fj um, En. Okay. okay, so this sum here is going to be Tfn squared. Uh, so from what I had uh, just before, I'm going to write this as this sum here. Each Tfn we just wrote a moment ago as Tfn or rather the norm squared of TFN we just wrote a moment ago uh, as TFN, TFJ, when you sum over J equals one to N, inner product squared. Right. So I can interchange these uh, sums because I'm dealing with uh, the sum of non-negative terms. So no issue whatsoever there. J equals one to infinity. Um, so I do want to, well, I'll just write this here, Tfn Fj squared. But I want to bring the T over so I can use this here. So you just bring the T over and get a complex. So it's Fn T star Fj, but swap them because it's modulus. So this is really going to be T star Fj, Fn. Okay, but this here we have as this uh, sum. Okay, so this is going to be uh, equal to. Uh, one second. Right, so this is going to be equal to j equals one to infinity n equals one to infinity uh, sorry about that So this equals j equals one to infinity n equals one to infinity t star um, f j n Okay, but let's do the same uh, silly kind of thing with adjoints. Let's bring the T back to the EN and just you know swap them because there's a modulus here. So this is bring this is going to be FJ inner product TEN, which is equal to TEN inner product FJ.
that. So it's going to be T E N F J. Well, what we wrote down on the previous uh, um, previous uh, few um, uh, slides is that this whole thing here is going to be equal to just um, uh, well, actually, so I want to interchange the sums back again one more time. So this is going to be equal to uh, so that n equals one to infinity, j equals one to infinity, t n f j inner product squared. And each one of these is equal to the norm of T E N squared. We wrote that down a few slides ago, just like, um, you know, just like this one here is the norm of T F N squared. All right, and that completes the proof. Um, so some clever uses of adjoints and yeah, I mean, I, if you count it up, it's probably maybe four or five uses of Parseval's theorem. But uh, I mean, that was the task here, um, particularly that any two of these sums are equal. So if one is finite, then so is the other and vice versa. Right. So that takes care of the proof. One of these sums is finite, then so is um, the other for any other Hilbert uh, space orthonormal basis. Okay. Um, so a little proposition is that T is Hilbert Schmidt implies that T is compact. Um, and not a whole lot to this. Uh, just truncate in the, the, the kind of, I guess here we're going to truncate in a slightly different way than we did before in terms of finite rank operators. So instead here, let's uh, first put T uh, and let's say PN with respect to any orthonormal basis whatsoever. Um, I guess I should use X, but whatever. Uh, so remember, this is just the same operator we've been, you know, we've dealt with this whole uh, really video. Pick an orthonormal basis, doesn't matter which. Uh, call it E, E J or E K rather. Uh, remember, this is just um, uh, H E K. So this here is just going to be. Um, oops. K equals one to n. H E K. T E K. So this is obviously, as I mentioned, finite rank. So um, let's get a, a nor an estimate for this norm here. So the norm of H equals one T H minus T H squared. This is going to be equal to um, just like we've done, uh, well, sorry, it's a little different here. Can't, cannot use um, Pythagorean's theorem because we do not know if T of EK is orthonormal. In general, it's not going to be. There's no reason it should be. Okay, so, um, yeah, so we don't need a squared here, but we can still use the triangle inequalities. 
It's a bit crude whenever you do this, but that's all right. So just like before, Tn minus T, or let's do uh, T minus Tn. Um, yeah, T minus Tn, you can always write Th um, yeah, so I'll do this uh, if it's not clear. So, um, right, so I'm here, I'm going to do the, use the fact that H is H E K E K. So TH is K equals one to infinity, H E K T E K. So these sums here, are the same except one goes from one to n. This one goes from one to infinity. Okay. So when you subtract the two, well, it's just going to go from I don't know why I have j k equals n plus one to infinity. So it's h e k t e k. So I'm going to get rid of this. Uh, so yeah, just smashing uh, norms using a triangle inequality. Bit crude whenever you do something like this, but you know it works sometimes. And now I'm just going to use Cauchy-Schwartz for this infinite sum, which makes sense because we know that the sum of the TEKs in norm converges. The L2, uh, or, or rather, um, this is less than or equal to um, this right here, K equals one to infinity. Um, Uh, don't want to do that. Uh, I'll just stick with k equals. We got to be a little careful here. So let's just. So it's going to be this here, h e k squared times this sum here. T e k squared to the one half. Well, actually here, this doesn't really give me anything better than just going from k equals one to infinity. And this is not negative, so that's fine. So this here is going to be equal to the norm of h squared times the sum here, k equals n plus one to infinity, t e k squared to one half, Well, this is equal to one. And this goes to zeros and goes to infinity. Again, for the simple reason that this sum converges because T is Hilbert Schmidt. Okay, so um, yeah, T is Hilbert Schmidt. Okay, one of the really nice things about this and one of the main applications uh, of the Hilbert Schmidt concept is that um, it gives us a very concrete way of deciding or, or, or showing that an integral operator is um, uh, Hilbert Schmidt and thus compact. Okay, so in a lot of different areas of analysis, even in um, you know um, differential geometry, where you're going to study uh, you know L two on manifold Ramanian manifolds, or, or uh, particularly yeah Ramanian manifolds uh, with respect to a, a volume um, form. 
um, you want to know when integral operators are compact. Okay? And uh, yeah, so uh, let's say K, and let's just stick to um, L2 on Euclidean space. Let's say we have something in L2 of Rn times Rn. Then I claim that the integral operator with kernel k, meaning k of x, y, f of y, y, this is Hilbert Schmidt on L2. And thus, compact. Okay. So we have a very nice, simple, uh, sufficient uh, condition for compactness of an integral operator. All right. Okay. So I mentioned, uh, I don't know, don't know which video, but uh, L2 uh, on Euclidean space is certainly separable. Uh, it's a separable uh, you know, as a metric space, it's separable. It has a countable dense, uh, uh, countable dense subset. Just play around with um, characteristic functions, basically. Um, it's not really deep. Right, right so it's separable. Um, so let's do the following. And I'm taking, as usual, the proof that's in the book. Let's define for fixed x, k, x, y. So this here for fixed x is an L2 of Rn. Is just going to be well, k of x, y. Okay. So we're assuming that for each, well, well, um, yeah, this is going to be an L2 of Rn for each fixed uh, x. Okay. You um, can check that. So, um, right, or at least for, uh, for almost every x. Yeah, and uh, I mean, if you're confused about that, I guess I'll just explain that real quick. So by Fubini's theorem, this here, k of x, uh, y, um, right, this is finite. So that implies um, uh, right. So this is going to imply that uh, this integral here is finite almost everywhere. Right, so um, yeah, so this is finite for almost every x and r. So for almost every x fixed, this is an L2, right? All right, so let's just play around with uh, Parseval's uh, equality again. Uh, so let's say En is an orthonormal basis of L2. We, again, we don't care which it is. Um, so uh, Tk of En for almost every x is going to be part of the N, K of x, Y, 
e n y d y, and this is going to be equal to write this as an inner product k x e n bar. Okay, um, right. So what does this mean? This means take T K E N L two. So this is L two of R N. This is L two of R N. Well, you just uh, just integrate this. Integrate. Take the squared of the center product. Okay, um, right, so let's sum this up. T-K-E-N. So I can use, I can interchange integrals and sums uh, as monotone convergence theorem. Yeah, so I'm gonna sum this. So if I sum this up, I'm going to interchange sums and integrals. It's the integral of the sum here. So it's going to be kx. You should see where this is going. Well, uh, anyway, it's the L2 inner product. So EN is an orthonormal basis if and only if EN bar is an orthonormal basis for L2 particularly. Um, you can check that very easily. It's really not much to it. So uh, by using Parseval's theorem, this gives me just the L2 norm of Kx squared. I remember this is Rn. Well, that's just uh, integrating this function um, with respect to y, square it, integrate it. So this is just trivially. And the non-trivial thing here is fitting this, but I think I can manage it. Barely. Uh, sorry, it's a bit messy. Okay, so this is dy. Well, let me move this over a bit. This is, uh... So, yeah, this is the double integral which we're assuming is finite. Uh, dy. Okay. And again, uh, because En is an orthonormal basis, L2 of Rn, because En is, uh, En bar is also, and vice versa, En bar, En is an orthonormal basis of L2, if and only if En bar is. All right, so that takes care of the proof. Okay, so what I want to do now is briefly talk about uh, eigenvalues, and in the next video, we will prove the spectral theorem for uh, compact self-adjoint uh, operators. All right, so we all know what eigenvalues are. Just to kind of remind you that, uh, or we should know what an eigenvalue is. Let's say we have just a, a linear map between um, two uh, vector spaces. 
So I particularly want to highlight uh, the kind of differences between uh, existence of eigenvalues uh, when we're dealing with infinite dimensional spaces and finite dimensional spaces. Right. <clears throat> okay. So um, let's assume that we're uh, dealing with complex uh, Hilbert space, complex uh, vector spaces. So this is an eigenvalue of T. <clears throat> with corresponding eigenvector uh, x so uh, actually let's say x goes to x doesn't really make sense otherwise okay, so tx is going to be lambda um, X, right? Right, so uh, for example, if X is uh, CN, well, we know what linear maps look like on CN. They're all basically um, N by N matrices. This is n by n matrix. <clears throat> um, right, so of course this here is the same thing as saying that uh, T minus lambda times the identity on X equals zero, or apply to X, this is going to be equal to zero. So, right, in the finite dimensional CN case, we want to look at when this has a non trivial kernel. And that's going to have a non trivial kernel precisely when the determinant is zero. Okay, so, we know basic linear algebra is, lambda is an eigenvalue. If and only if eigenvalue of uh, T, if and only if the determinant of T minus lambda I n by n identity matrix equals zero. So in particular, complex at least eigenvalues always uh, exist. At least in this uh, very nice uh, case here. And again, well, why is that true? If T is an n by n matrix, this is just a uh, nth degree polynomial. And we always know that there's at least one, uh, well, it has uh, counting multiplicity, it has n roots. that might be complex. Okay, uh, there's a lot of examples you can cook up and, for infinite dimensional spaces that do not have eigenvalues. Uh, let's look at one example. And let's say uh, this is just L2 of zero to one. And let's say TF, is a multiplication by x. Okay. So if um, if tf equals lambda f in L two, so two functions are equal in L two precisely when they're equal almost everywhere. Well, what does this tell me? This tells me that T, um, and I should say, uh, 
we we require that this is not zero. Okay, we require that x is not equal to zero. X equals zero is silly. T times zero is zero. Lambda times zero is zero. So that's not very useful. So lambda could be zero, but we require the vector x to not be zero. So um, in particular here, f is not zero almost everywhere. Well, what does this tell me? This tells me that um, for almost every x in zero to one, x f of x equals lambda f of x. Well, f um, because we're assuming f is not equal to um, <clears throat> zero almost everywhere, um, this uh, is going to basically uh, tell me that, um, well, well, this is kind of a contradiction. Well, this says that basically x minus lambda f of x equals zero, for almost every uh, x in zero to one, well, this here obviously equals zero, if and only if x equals lambda. So for one single x, this is zero. So almost everywhere, this is not zero. So that means f equals zero. almost everywhere on zero to one. So, um, so the point here is that T has no eigenvalues. All right. Okay, um, right. So, um, so remember we figured out what the uh, adjoint of mul uh, multiplication operator is. It's just multiplication by the uh, complex conjugate. Well, X is real, so. So the, the adjoint of multiplication by X is just multiplication by X bar, which is multiplication by X. So. T is self-adjoint. Okay. So it's curious to note, and I should mention uh, basically the same argument here, literally the same argument works for any single L infinity function whatsoever um, that is not zero almost everywhere. Uh, no um, multiplication operator has eigenvalues um, on L2. <clears throat> Right, unless we're dealing with the zero multiplication operator, which is not very interesting. Um, <clears throat> so this is self-adjoint. Now you should notice, well, I'll prove in a second, T is not compact. And really the argument I present for this works for also any, um, uh, any uh, multiplication operator uh, by let's say G where G again is L infinity and is not equal to zero almost everywhere. You do have to do a, uh, some non-trivial measure theory to do that, some highly non-trivial measure theory. Uh, so that's why I'm just we're working with multiplication by x to keep things a little simple. Um, but the, basically the same argument I'm going to present works. Okay, so how do we prove that? Well, let's pick a very convenient, useful, bounded subset of L2 of 0 to 1. Um, so let's pick any, nothing special about the interval 1 half to 1. Uh, anything where this is not equal to zero works, and it's a subset of zero to one. So let's say we have a 
a sequence of disjoint open intervals. I don't care what these are. I don't care explicitly for writing this down. Let's just say these are disjoint open intervals. There's a million ways you can cook this up. Um, but, um, right, so let's pick a convenient, uh, well, bounded sequence of orthogonal, uh, well, really orthonormal functions. So let's say Fn is simply one over uh, the length of I n to the one half times a characteristic function of I n. So let's compute this uh, inner product for n not equal to m. Well, this is obviously just going to be zero to one uh, x squared times these two characteristic functions. Um, over the two lengths. Well, it's it's zero. Because these sets are pairwise disjoint. Um, sorry about that. Move this over a bit. Try to give myself plenty of room. And so, yeah, here I mean pairwise disjoint open intervals. So, yeah, this is going to be zero. Because this is uh, empty. Okay. So I claim that given any subsequence T or FNK, we're not going to have a Cauchy sequence, and hence TFNK does not converge. So no subsequence, for no subsequence FNK does TFNK converge. Let's see why this is true. Okay. So by Pythagorean's theorem, this is going to be because these are orthogonal, just computed this. Here I assuming, I'm assuming K not equal to M. And again, this is just some arbitrary uh, subsequence of Fn. Right. So this is going to be equal to T uh, Fn K squared T Fn M. All right. All right, so let's just get one of these. Uh, it's bigger than the max of these, that's for sure. Um, and this is not a terribly subtle computation here, or estimate rather. This is going to be equal to zero to one over the length of I and K. Well, characteristic function of i and k times x. Okay. So in uh, particular, oh, sorry, x squared. So in particular, we're integrating over i and k. So it's x squared and just bring out the length, divide by one over the length.
Okay, uh, but the whole point here is that, well, this is a disjoint interval contained in one half the one. So x is big or equal to one half. x squared is big or equal to one fourth. So this is one fourth the length of i and k integral i and k x equals one four. So if this whole thing here is a star, then this here is big or equal to one-fourth plus one-fourth is one-half. So this is not Cauchy. So FNK uh, is certainly bounded. It's, ortho, it's an orthonormal sequence. So I didn't prove that it has norm one, but just check very easily, it has norm one. Basically, this computation here without T tells me that, well, um, you know, you get rid of the X squared, you just get one. So it's kind of trivial that it's bounded. Yeah, so this is not Cauchy, uh, and that says this is not convergent. So no subsequence. You cannot, so take any subsequence FNK of FN, pi T, it's not going to be convergent. And that implies that uh, T not compact. Okay. Okay. Um, right. So really what I want to look at is when, you know, when does an operator on a Hilbert space in particular have an eigenvalue? We just saw that self-adjoint but not compact is not enough. Um, you know, this multiplication by x on L2 is not compact, it's self-adjoint, and it has no eigenvalues. Let's see now that compact but not self-adjoint is not enough to guarantee eigenvalues. And this is actually an exercise in the book that I'll just flesh out a little bit. So in this example, let's say x is little l2 of the natural of the um, of the integers, and let's say w is a weighted shift, and I forget which this is chapter four homework uh, in the book. So this is going to be, uh, you shift everything over by one, but instead of uh, x1, x2, x3, it's basically one over k, xk for each natural number k. So it's x1, one half, x2, one third, x3, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So it's not too bad, but it's a little, you got to do some work. You got to be a little careful. Uh, homework is that W is compact. So W uh, takes L2 to L2. But uh, the adjoint um, is going to be, uh, it's like the backwards shift, a weighted backwards shift. So the adjoint, you can check, is not going to be equal to W. 
Uh, we did uh, basically we did the adjoint of forward shift many videos ago to get the backward shift. This is basically very similar. Um, so they're certainly not going to be the same operator. So this is not self adjoint. This is compact. So I claim W has no eigenvalues. And uh, there's really not much to this. Uh, let's just check it. Um, this is kind of clever, I think. Um, so it kind of says, you know, this is maybe not such an innocent looking operator after all. Uh, you know, these kind of shifts and these weighted, this weighted shift. Um, okay, so. So let's say Wx equals lambda x. So what are we saying? We're saying zero x one, x two over two, right? yeah, one half x two, et cetera, et cetera. This is going to be equal to um, lambda x one, lambda x2, make sure my lambdas don't look like x's. Yeah, so this is wx, this is lambda x. Okay, well, what does this tell me? In particular, this tells me that these two have to be equal. These two have to be equal, et cetera, et cetera. These two have to be equal. Okay, and let's read off of, let's, let's see what this tells me. So first of all, if lambda equals zero, um, well, lambda equals zero, then everything here is zero. So then that's saying x1 equals zero, x2 equals zero. So x is just a zero element in L2, so that's impossible. Uh, eigenvectors have to be non-zero. So the uh, second case is lambda is not equal to zero. So uh, in that case, zero is lambda Z lambda x1 is zero, just equating the two red here. So divide by lambda, which is not zero, gives me x1 equals zero. All right. Well, um, let's compute the, let, let's uh, equate the yellow. Then lambda x2 is x1 is zero, you see where this is going, implies x2 equals zero. So x1 is lambda x2, it's from the yellow. Um, keep going. You get everything here is zero. So x equals zero. So the conclusion is that W has no eigenvalues. Okay, so compact is not enough to guarantee eigenvalues. Self-adjoint is not enough to guarantee eigenvalues, but it turns out compact and self-adjoint guarantees eigenvalues. So if you combine the two, you're guaranteed to have eigenvalues.
So we have the following theorem, which in some sense, uh, it's important unto itself, but it's really uh, a, kind of a, a precursor of the uh, spectral theorem. It's, uh, and in some sense, the spectral theorem is going to be, uh, it's going to be iterating this, this theorem to uh, build up a orthonormal uh, basis of eigenvectors. But uh, yeah, so let's say we have uh, T is a bounded operator on a Hilbert space, doesn't have to be self-adjoint. Um, let's say it's compact and self-adjoint. Then either the norm of T or minus the norm of T is an eigenvalue of T. Okay, so what is the uh, proof? Well, we proved uh, quite a few lectures ago. Well, first of all, let's just take something, take care of some trivial case. T equals zero implies the norm of T equals zero. Um, so in this case, this theorem is kind of trivially true. Um, you know, everything's an eigenvalue uh, if T equals, uh, or zero is always an eigenvalue if T equals zero. Zero times X is zero. Lambda times X is zero for any X. So um, that's not very interesting. So let's assume uh, T is not equal to zero. And that means the operator norm of T is not equal to zero. Okay, so remember we proved quite a few lectures ago now we're gonna put this to very good use. That self-adjoint operators are rather special in that um, the norm is given by this following supremum. Usually it's uh, the supremum of Tx inner product Y where both X and Y are unit vectors but we can actually just get the norm of T as this supremum TXX in a product over all X big, all X equal one. Okay, okay uh, so by definition of supremum, we can pick sequence XN of unit vectors where the norm of T is going to be uh, this limit here. Okay. Well, this quantity here is real. If you forget why, Well, it's just an easy computation using self-adjointness. Um, this is going to be Xn, Txn. Usually it's T star, but T star is T. So so Txn, Xn is T complex conjugate Txn, Xn implies that Txn and Txn Xn is real. Okay, so what does this tell me? <clears throat> well, um, Right, so we're saying that this sequence of real numbers approaches 
the norm of t. And we're taking the absolute value here. So this says that, and you can do this, you, you know, write this, make this precise in epsilon delta or uh, epsilon big N notation. But what this is saying is for N large T X N X N has to be plus or minus, basically plus or minus the norm of T. All right, so passing to a subsequence, if necessary, we can assume that Txn xn converges to either plus or minus the norm of T. We don't really care which, because whichever it is, that's going to be our eigenvalue. We're trying to prove that one of these is an eigenvalue. So when we write passing to a subsequence if necessary, basically what we're really saying is it's kind of a pain in the ass to use subsequence notation for the rest of the proof. So we're not. Uh, we're just going to basically work with a subsequence without changing our notation. We assume... Uh, Txn xn converges uh, to uh, T or the norm of, or minus the norm of T. Okay, either one denoted by lambda. That's Right. Okay. Uh, or it matters, but I guess. Okay. Um, right. So let's do, uh, let's look at this norm here. And I claim this norm in my Hilbert space, Txn minus lambda Xn converges to zero as N goes to zero. This is going to be Txn, uh, sorry, Txn minus lambda Xn. So you should notice that if this goes to zero and Xn did converge to something non-zero, then we would get Lambda is an eigenvalue. Okay. Well, we have to prove those two things, and we're going to use compactness to do that. So first, we just want to check this. It's nothing to do with compactness. It's just a little computation that's pretty straightforward. Okay, so this is going to be uh, the norm of Txn squared, just these two. Then it's going to be uh, minus Txn or minus lambda. Lambda is real. It's plus or minus the norm of T. So pull out the minus lambda Txn Xn. Uh, it's minus lambda Xn Txn, which is Txn Xn. It's self-adjoint. Um, Squeeze this in. Well, I don't think I can squeeze it in, but that's all right. Uh, and so this is going to be the last term is just well, lambda squared, it's real, times the norm of xn squared. Well, this equals one. We're picking unit vectors. So it's just going to be, uh, get rid of this. This is just lambda squared. Oops. All 
All right, so um, obviously this is less than or equal to the operator norm squared times the norm of Xn. Well, again, that's one. So we just get rid of it, this is equal to one. Right. Um, well, that is what lambda is. So this is lambda squared. Lambda is plus or minus the operator norm. So lambda squared is the operator norm squared. So this is just lambda squared. It's less than or equal to lambda squared. Well, we have two lambda squared. So it's two lambda squared and then minus two of these. Okay. Well, Txn Xn converges to uh, plus or minus the operator norm of T. Um, one second. Uh, sorry, forgot the, the lambda here. Lambda didn't go anywhere. So this is um, two lambda, okay? Well, or rather Txn Xn converges to whatever, you know, converges to lambda. It's, it's um, the operator norm of T or minus the operator norm of T, it doesn't matter which, but this converges to lambda so this converges to two lambda squared minus two lambda times lambda is two lambda squared. Oh, lo and behold, that's zero. So this converges to zero. Right. Okay, so this equals uh, zero. All right, so now let's use compactness. T is compact, so we can pick a subsequence. Xn is norm one, each Xn. So pick a subsequence and K. Where this is conversion, let's say it's conversion to Y. Okay. Um, yeah, and I claim that uh, lambda y equals ty, right? All right, so uh, yeah, let's see why this is true. Um, well, first of all, lambda x and k minus y, it's going to be less than or equal to add and subtract t x and k. Lambda x and k minus t x and k plus t x and k minus y. Well, they both go to zero, right? We just proved this right here, right? Uh, second. So certainly it's true for a subsequence. Uh, Tx and k minus lambda x and k goes to zero. Uh, and Txn converges to Y, so T Txn K converges to Y, so um, this converges to zero, both of these converge to zero. Okay, so uh, what does this tell me? Um, yeah, so lambda X and K converges to Y, 
So Ty uh, converges just because T is bounded. Um, well, it converges to uh, T um, let me write this way. Ty is this limit here, lambda x and k. Well, I can pull out the lambda, obviously. T is linear. Well, Tx and k converges to y. So this is just lambda uh, y. So we are done if we can prove that y is not equal to zero. Okay. We have to prove that. I mean, we're done if y is not equal to zero. Um, and that's not too difficult to do. T, x, and k. Uh, let's um, use the reverse triangle inequality. So this is going to be lambda, just add and subtract x and k. So this is bigger equal to by the reverse triangle inequality, uh, x and k minus the norm of tx and k minus lambda x and k. Well, uh, this here is going to be equal to um, absolute value of lambda. This has norm one, the x and k's. Well, this converges to zero as n goes to infinity. So this converges to lambda So by continuity of norms, the norm of y is this limit here. And this limit here we figured out is big or equal to absolute value of lambda, just from this here. Well, that's equal to the norm of t. Lambda is plus or minus the norm of t. And, well, this is positive. So yeah, um, we're done. Okay, um, yeah, so we're gonna put this in the next video to good use and prove the uh, spectral theorem for uh, self-adjoint compact operators. And uh, time permitting in the video, I'll prove the Fredholm alternative, which as I mentioned is extremely useful particularly in elliptic PDE theory. Um, if you get Evan's PDE book, you'll see in the PDE book uh, that he, it's one of the main results in functional analysis that he kind of has in his appendix that he uses to prove uh, existence results for elliptic PDEs. So, all right, so long, take care, bye-bye.